Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. It's Af Malhotra on Straight Talk with Af. Uh, I have a very special guest on this show today, someone who I have been watching and tracking for quite a few months now, and our connection was serendipitous. The universe was almost compelling me to reach out to this gentleman uh, for a variety of reasons, one of which was uh, we seem to have some some overlap in 23andMe, the, the DNA site. So I thought, well, this, this, ch this chap is definitely my cousin of some sort or related to me. That's one reason. Two, he's super um, brilliant as a leader, as a thinker. A three, he has a deep, dark story as well. And I connect to that. As you all know, I have a, a bit of a challenging health past. And I have immense respect for someone who is able to get through these dark times and dust themselves off and move forward. Four, he is also a musician. And there are a few other reasons which I'm going to talk about now. So welcome to the show, Nurin Chaudhary. What a pleasure to have you here with us on Straight Talk. Fantastic to be here, Af. Uh, my long lost cousin. Yeah, right, exactly. We're like third or fourth cousin or something, but we're, you know, in the Indian setup, it means there's a bridge there somewhere. You know, we'll have someone connected at some point. So, Niran, I, I didn't mention, but, you know, you're a, you're a, the chairman of uh, Panera Brands and you're a leader. You have been a leader of many brands, global brands in the, in the past, multi billion dollar companies. So, you've made your mark. You have this incredible way of articulating very complex things, actually, into um, into a manner that is not just simple but compelling for listeners. And I've had the pleasure of enjoying listening to you because I've done my homework and I've watched all of your YouTube videos. And I was like, this guy. And I, I'm honestly, I, sh I was shaking my head at quite a few things you were saying. I was like, that's a, that's a fantastic analogy. That's a fantastic way of looking at how to deal with trauma. So you're, a, for me, you're a wholesome person. You've got it. You've been through all of it, really. And I'd like to, before we go into leadership and so on, I'd like to go all the way back to your personal story, because that's what Straight Talk is about. You know, you are a product of who who you are as a person, were as a person, as a child, where you've come from and so on. So tell us a little bit about uh, Niran, the young man or the child, where were you born and how did it all happen and a bit about your family and then and then we'll naturally migrate into to leadership, if that's okay. Absolutely, yeah. A real pleasure to be on the show. Uh, so, you know, it all began in, uh, I was born in India um, and uh, to, very loving parents um, who realized the importance of giving me great education and, and, and life experiences. And as you know, I think I really believe that who we are is a function of not what happens to us, but how we respond to what happens to us. It's in that choice of how we respond to what happens to us, I think that our destiny unfolds. And as I join the dots, as I look back, I think that's probably uh, been a, a defining uh, aspect uh, of my past. So I think so a great childhood, like I said, you know, went to great schools. Um, and then I think the earliest memory that I have is when I was um, 16 and I fell in love with my wife. I saw her, she was 14 years old and she walked into wow. my life. I had, you know, in the classic Bollywood sense, bells ringing and wind <laughs> And it was love at first sight for me, not for her. Um, <laughs> And uh, I had to work very hard to to win her over. But that was a very important pivotal moment because I've been married to that woman for the last 35 odd years, been known her for 40 odd years. She's my best friend. And um, I'm very grateful for her. And I think as you uh, move forward from that, um, uh, when we were, we were married very young, you know, I was just 24. Yeah. And right early uh, at that point in time, we lost our first daughter. Uh, her name was Tanya. She died of severe combined immune deficiency. She was eight months old and I was just a kid myself. I was like 24. I had absolutely no comprehension with what was happening to me and how I was meant to deal with it. It was, mm. it was absolutely a crushing blow. Um, and I think after that, uh, you know, we had my son, uh, whose uh, name is Ashan. He's now 32 years old. He's a very uh, famous musician in the US, uh, and a quick plug-in for his band name is called Memba, uh, for all those who are electronic music fans. 
He's also married to a very talented uh, singer, uh, Evan Gia is her band name, and very grateful for him. Fantastic kid, uh, great heart, very, very talented, a good human, and mm. so proud of him. Mm. And then after that, just as we thought our life was getting settled and we were going to live happily ever after, that we, sh you know, kind of um, had our share of burdens and challenges with Tanya's loss, Aisha was born. And um, Aisha was a child of faith and wasn't really planned. Um, but uh, we had her and thinking that, you know, what are the chances that what happened to Tanya is going to happen again? And well, that's what happened. And Aisha was born with a compromised immune system. And uh, once again, we were on a roller coaster of life. Um, uh, I was determined uh, to give her the best opportunity to live. So took her to the UK, got a bone marrow transplant done. But ironically, what saved her actually ended up killing her because when she became 13 years old, we realized that the chemotherapy that she had to undergo for the bone marrow transplant had irreversibly damaged her lungs and she developed pulmonary fibrosis. Her lungs were very fibrotic and getting harder and harder. And the doctors gave us the dire prognosis that she will uh, not live beyond another five years, that by 18 she would be gone. Mm. And you can imagine um, how traumatic that was. And, you know, we shared that with Aisha. And what's remarkable is, you know, that girl did not say, well, I have only five years to live. She said, well, I have five years to live. And she lived, lived it with such intensity that she achieved more in those five years than many of us do in a lifetime. And she continues to be my biggest inspiration. And then I think, so those ups and downs of losses and setbacks have been an intrinsic part um, built on the foundation of love for my wife, you know, and the relationship that we have, yeah. and which has in some ways just deepened our connection. And, and here we are, you know, I lost Aisha in 2015. And interestingly, every time I lost a child, Tanya first, and then Aisha later, it has led to a pivot in my career. Um, you know, I, I was working with the Tatars when, Aisha, when Tanya passed away and I felt the only way I, I could get past it was to change and I joined Yum Brands. Mm -hmm. And I worked in Yum Brands for 25 years. And then when Aisha died, I felt the same urge, a desire to reset the button to start again. Mm -hmm. That's when I moved on to my, uh, my next employee and worked with Krispy Kreme and Panera Brands and so forth. So that's kind of a quick um, personal story um, of, you know, how my life has been uh, yeah. thus far. Thank you. Thank you for sharing it. And uh, I have a few I have a few thoughts and a few questions, if that's OK. Of course. I think. Uh, firstly, where were you when this happened? Which part of the world were you in? Uh, th when Tanya uh, passed away, I was in <laughs> India. Okay. And then. Um, we lived in Europe uh, with uh, Aisha and Ishan for about 10 years. And then when Aisha passed away, we were back in India again. And after that, uh, I lived in the US uh, and in the UK with my current role. Mm. I mean, I, there's one strong relatability factor. I, I've never really shared this actually on a podcast, but um, maybe now is a good time to share it because you've been so honest and open about your journey with your daughters. So, you know, it's amazing how miracles happen. Like your daughter got that treatment in the UK and it worked, right? It worked. Yeah. And then the, the side effect of that treatment is what actually took her away, which you would have never thought. Cause I guess at that point you were like, I've got to, got to do, I've got to fix this problem at hand. And I had a similar episode with me, uh, you know, thankfully I, I'm here, I'm standing and I'm having a conversation with you and uh, I'm, I'm alive, really. I'm very, very grateful for that every day. And I know, I know you've learned that from your daughter as well and as a parent. I had a certain condition without going into too much detail and I was given the most potent combination of steroids that you can imagine, essentially to keep me alive because I would have died. And of course, I stayed alive. And the repercussions of that, the consequence was that that drug destroyed my hips mm. because it, it, it can give you avascular necrosis. It can basically suck out um, all of the, or kill all of the, the blood supply to a part of your body. 
and you know i had to have a hip replacement the other ones is just about i'm very cautious with it i'm like not again and so i it, it is it's incredible when i think when the universe has is calling you to some degree then in some way shape or form you end up going and i i'm believing more and more in in you know as you would i don't know how you've processed it but i certainly through trauma and having lost a few uh, both my parents um I certainly believe that there are other realms that exist. I think we would be foolish to think that you and I having this conversation in the flesh, which is really quite a very basic vehicle, is all there is. I am a big believer in multi realms, and uh, you know, in in that in that existence, and I practice it too. So I, I hear you, um, and I'm connected with you. I wanted to ask you how you and your wife. I mean, it's amazing that you've got this beautiful connection and by the way i pursued mine too and i had to make her work hard to, to love to love me i was certainly in love with her as well so i i connect with you there going back to loss though you know losing a, a child and then losing another child sometimes you hear that people just can't be with one another in fact you're like every time you see that person you just think of the loss and you think well it's better that i'm not with you and of course you're you know let's not forget and this is but this is a very important question i want to just get you to answer really you know you're a successful executive in the corporate world you know busy trying to make it happen and you were much younger then as well you know like you said 24 and then later on i guess you were in your 30s or something uh, at that point so i don't i don't know 2015 40s um how did you think about work when all this was going on like how how did you concentrate on a high flying job when this was going on at home. Yeah, I think a couple of uh, good questions there. One is, I think, uh, about my relationship. And, mm. you know, very often relationships don't survive the loss of one child, leave alone loss of two children. Right. And I just want to share with everybody, because I think this is important, as to how you can find ways to stay together when the dynamics are so difficult that invariably I think people basically fall apart. What I have learned is that when you're dealing with a terminally sick child or a friend or a family member, I think realizing that you respect all opinions around you uh, from people that deeply care about the person in question and that you listen with an open heart, not just an open mind, an open heart, because you have to live with the consequences of the decisions that you make. And some decisions you will get that are right, some decisions will be wrong. But if you listen with an open heart, I think you will develop a sense of empathy for the point of view of others who also care for that individual. And sometimes it is good to just step back and give the benefit of doubt, if, if that were to be the case, to the person in question. So I think, for example, I've always felt in my case like, you know, my grief is deep, but I cannot even begin to imagine the grief of a mother. You know, mother, the child is a physical part of her being, you know. So with that came a huge amount of respect in my mind that at the end, I have to respect how my wife feels. So, you know, when Aisha was very sick, we were debating whether we should have a uh, lung transplant. and. Um, I was very keen to do it because I was just desperate to have her live as much as she could and hope for a miracle. And my wife and Aisha herself were more mature and more courageous in saying, no, either I want a full quality of life or I'd rather go. That's a very difficult thing for a mother to say. And I respected and honored that, you know, even though it was not what I wanted to do. And I think when you make those kind of decisions through empathy and respect for each other with an open heart, you don't cause wounds along the way in the relationship. So that I think is very important. The second is I think the, when you have this kind of profound loss, um, you realize that you are actually alone together. You know, you beyond a point, you know, you cannot help the other person to manage his or her grief. You cannot do it. No matter how much you love them, you just cannot do it. Each one of us has to find their own way. 
and therefore allowing each other again the respect and the space to heal in your own way in your own time doing what works for you and not trying to impose you know your point of view i think is so important and i think through that sense of gentle compassion and empathy you can actually become even closer and hold each other tighter even as you heal separately you know so i think that's uh, that's very important and i just wanted to share that it got triggered by the question that you asked yeah uh, thanks you know the uh, second question you said was about work yeah <laughs> and you know this um it's i'll tell you the the loss of my two daughters in some ways brought home to me the importance of being successful when i lost tania i didn't have the financial means to pay for her hospital bills in an indian hospital and they wouldn't let us leave because i didn't have the money mm. i didn't have money to buy an air ticket to take her to a hospital of repute in the southern part of the country i just did not have money and my employees went together and and got some money for me and i felt so desperate as a father and i i just felt like a failure as a father that you know how can i not provide for my children and then similarly when aisha was diagnosed and i knew that i needed a bone marrow transplant living in india the cost was prohibitive 150000 pounds for an outpatient a foreigner I had only about two thousand dollars in the bank. I didn't have any money, and then again, you know, I had to through the generosity of a country that was not our own, which is the UK, you know, who who just donated so generously for the cause of my daughter. We were able to save her, but again, in that moment, I felt that desperate feeling of not being successful, not having the financial means to look after my family, and. how that was just not acceptable to me and therefore i had this firm resolve and determination that i don't want to ever be in a position where i cannot take care of the people that i love and that became a big drive and and i realized that that meant that i had to really you know separate my personal challenges with what i needed to do at work and really be there a thousand percent focused on what i needed to do to be able to contribute to make an impact and make a difference and then get bigger challenges and do the same but it's easier said than done and i think it comes down actually to a habit that you inculcate moment by moment by moment and my habit was that when i left the house and aisha you know imagine that i'm going to work i was running uh, the india business at that time and aisha prognosis was 5 years and she's going to be she's not going to be with us anymore i would leave having looked after her with my wife at night exhausted in mm. the car and i would in my mind open up a box uh literally in my mind figuratively and i would then put all my troubles shut the lid on the box and then the car would drive out i would enter my uh, the lift to the building and the lift door would open and i would say show time and i would pull my shoulder back put a smile on her face and remind myself that this is my family at work it's not their fault that i'm having these difficulties i have to be my best self for them yeah. and then i think the moment by moment thing was that any meeting you know your mind would obviously move into i wonder what's happening with her and i wonder i hope she's doing okay and you have to get disciplined in just taking that off deflecting that and focusing deflecting and focusing in the moment and being fully present in the moment to do what needed to get done and i've had to really sort of work on that over the last many many years so those are the reasons you know the in the intrinsic motivation that i must be there and provide for my family yeah and have the mental discipline to be in the moment so i can uh, really be the best that i can be uh, for my employees at work yeah that's extraordinary naren and as you describe it you describe it beautifully and as one processes it it sounds beautiful and it also feels terribly hard um it just feels very very hard and so i i just want to make it clear to all of them all of the people watching that god forbid you in this situation and you have had to endure this or are enduring this now uh, someone very close to me has just been through what you've been through the loss of a child i think about them as i ask you these questions 
it's quite a recent a recent event um i i guess it takes quite a lot of self discipline i think it takes i guess um a lot of training a lot of patience with yourself and i guess you you can't be too harsh on yourself either can you 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 have to sort of love yourself and respect yourself for I think for going through it sorry yeah no i i i think you know and I, I, there's more to it and i you're right it's it sounds sort of logical but it's very very hard to do and and i think the it really hits home when the person that you love actually passes away because the irreversibility of that the fact that they will never ever see that person ever again is you know is is very very hard to absorb so whilst you're going through it the human mind is such that you still always have hope right you always have hope no matter what's happening as human beings we're conditioned to live with hope right and i had hope for all those five years i knew that she won't survive but i said if there's anything in the world i will find it and that's how i you know kept going but what happens is that hope extinguishes the moment that person passes away it's gone you right mm -hmm. hope is gone it's now happened so i want to share uh with the listeners because i think i think losses and failures of this kind are inevitable for all of us it's part of our human journey you know right uh, and i i feel that you we we go through it we go through pain so that we can understand pleasure you know i really believe in the duality of if there was no pain you would not enjoy pleasure right so i think i remind myself to <laughs> keep that in context mm. even though that's a hard th thought to to hold but i i'll tell you when one has failures or losses over which one has no control there's no control you know i i've realized that i have found the following ways to kind of move to the other side the first first thing is to just sort of ask for serenity to accept the inevitable and what has happened to not fight it okay. and to just accept it and say okay i accept the fact that this has happened and i'm never going to see this person ever again and just repeating that to yourself i think is very important because a human the human mind can't comprehend with that you know that final separation once you do that i think the second step that you alluded to is forgive yourself no matter who you are as long as you love somebody else you always feel responsible for what has happened mm. and i think forgiving yourself because we're all human and we do the best that we can is what i've had to do and say okay i forgive my forgive myself for not being the father that could save my children and my daughter aisha for example before she passed away i was sitting with her and she held on to my hand and kept saying i don't want to die i don't want to die mm. and that you know that that really troubled me and i had to forgive myself and said you know there are some things i have no control over right the best that i could so forgiving yourself i think is very important so acceptance forgiveness and after that i realized is that you cannot give to others what you don't have and therefore you must learn to love yourself again and the healing really be ironically begins inside us by us saying okay i'm going to love myself again mm. and loving myself again is just honoring yourself and doing whatever the hell little pleasures that you have you know playing music playing tabla going for a walk going for a run speaking to friends going out for dinner it doesn't have to be anything like very complicated it's just yeah. the everyday joys where you acknowledge yourself and say this is not something i'm going to do once i retire or get old i'm going to do it right now the holiday that i wanted the language i wanted to learn you love yourself you know so you mm. take time to love yourself and then finally i realized that finding ways to serve others is very healing and my daughter you know writes in her book uh, my little epiphanies that she wrote just before she passed away that if you can't change your own life there's always someone else's right and there's it, that's a very powerful uh, epiphany where and i have found that you know in showing up and trying to be of service yeah. there is healing so acceptance forgiveness you know loving yourself and then actually 
And there's another element of service, which is it once again creates hope mm -hmm. that I have a meaning. I have something that is unfinished. I want to go out. I want to get up and I want to do something that is meaningful. So I think that's how that are some of the ways in which, you know, I still try to remind myself and keep one foot in front of the other and keep walking. Yeah. Yeah. That's beautifully put. I think you've encapsulated a lot in it's almost, I think, a uh, a better way of looking at dealing with grief, frankly, maybe an upgraded version of it, because the traditional models of, you know, grief, I get, I get that. But I think I'm not sure it's very helpful. I don't know how you found it. But I, you know, when, when I was going through grief or trauma, I think about acceptance, that's the only one I really think about. And from there, you know, denial, and they're not very helpful. Yeah, I think someone that, move forward. Yeah, I think that old model stops at acceptance. And I think <laughs> yeah, you have to move from acceptance to yeah. love and then purpose, you know, so. Yeah, I and I've, I have to say, because I know you do a lot of good work, I have to say, as I've begun to do more good work for other people, it's fascinating how that brings so much, not just joy, fulfillment and, and so on, but opportunities, opportunities too, that you would have never imagined would come your way in, you know, the wildest of imaginations, because you're giving without without expectations. And I think that's, I would say that's one thing I would add to your, I'm sure it's inherent, is giving and serving others without expectation. Yeah. Uh, because it detaches you from that model that we've been taught mostly in the West, which is do something. And then, you know, the, uh, the return's gonna be great, you know, input, outputs and so on. So, so that's incredible. I, you know, I'm so grateful you've shared that part of your life. And when we do meet together face-to-face -to -face at some point in London, we'll talk more and there's so much more to discuss. I'd like to switch gears towards, you know, I guess making an assumption here that those traumas, the wake of those traumas, you evolved as a person. Of course you have. I mean, I can, it's evident, of course. I did see you, you know, when I, before I got to know you, I spotted you, we talked about this before the show, apart from us being connected on 23andMe, I spotted you on LinkedIn and I saw that's when you were the CEO of the company you're now chairman of that you were traveling all over these these stores that you have and uh, hugging some of your uh, you know the managers high-fiving people at the ground level you know like with with the people serving and you had so much of that going on and you had videos and you had messages and i was like this guy this guy really does care i mean he does really care and I'm sure it wasn't easy because you had to leave your family wherever they were. I'm sure you weren't teleporting back home on the, on the same on the same evening. You had, you know, you were away from your family, and I'm sure you're a family man more than ever now and have been. Uh, and you continue to do that, and you're doing it now, like you're on my podcast, right? You don't have to be here, and you could be doing a thousand other things, but you're here. You're serving. You're serving others. You're helping me with my mission and my pur purpose and this, I'm curious and I want to learn and I'm developing and learning as we, as the minutes go by. Uh, let's talk about leadership because I, I do believe that what you're doing is quite extraordinary. It is not, it is not uh, commonplace having met many leaders and, and, you know, there are all sorts of leaders in this world, leaders without uh, formal authority, who I sometimes find are the best leaders. Actually, they've got the hardest gig. You know, Sadhguru, for example, who I hope to have on my show soon, you know, he's an example of a leader without authority who has done wonders for the planet, you know, with his tree plantation mission, for example. He rallied hundreds of thousands of people to plant trees at the same time without any authority, no bills, no all voluntary work and people all over the world, not just in India. It's just one of those examples. I feel that you have this ability to do that. I'm not sure what you're doing in your life right now, what you plan to do in the future, which we'll talk about momentarily. But tell us a bit about how you describe leadership really over the many, I think you've had many avatars, right? Or many realms that you live through and you've now you are here now in this, as a more informed human being, a more informed leader. And for those who don't know, what do you believe is leadership? Um, in the workforce today, because of course it, it's a broad definition, but in the workforce today, what is your definition of leadership and why? Sure. You know, I, I really um, believe that leadership is a privilege. Um, and it's an honor, really, um, uh, to be able to influence and to change and to impact. 
And as you impact, I really believe that it's a privilege because you have a unique opportunity to have a much broader impact than just creating enterprise value. Um, I believe that leaders need to have a wider aperture of what they impact. Uh, they can impact people, they can impact in their care, they can impact communities in which they operate, they can impact the planet, and they can create enterprise value. In fact, I'm a big believer that um, enterprise value can be sustainable if you're also looking after the other stakeholders. Um, profit should drive purpose, but purpose should also drive profit and can drive profit. Mm. It's hard. It's hard, but I think it can be done, and that's what leaders in the future ought to do. So that's kind of my take on what leadership is and, and why it's a privilege. And then to have any impact, you know, you need two things. You need strategy, how to win, and then you need to execute that, get it done. Yeah. I, I believe that off the two, both are important, of course, but off the two, execution is more important because strategy is to do with your intellect. You know, how are we going to win? But execution is to do with the heart, which is about wanting to win. And s companies may have similar strategies, but they, one may be successful versus the other because they execute differently. And the reason why they execute differently is because the teams are inspired, energized, motivated to go above and beyond every single day that they really want to win. It's not just like an intellectual exercise, it's like from the heart, a desire to really out-execute competition. So if that is true, the question is, how do you invoke that desire in an organization that might have you know, over 100,000 people or thousands of people? How do you really light that fire in the hearts of so many people across the enterprise that they they all wake up every single day trying to be the best version of who they can be at whatever it is that they do. You know, how do you do that? Yeah. I think that to me is the essence of leadership is to inspire people to go above and beyond what they thought was capable. And that's how you create a broader impact. So the question is, how do you do it? You know, how do you, re how do you really yeah, inspire? Absolutely. And how, do you, how did you do it? How did you do it? How do you do it? So I think that to me, the sort of one obvious thing is that first you've got to be inspired yourself, right? Yeah. Like I really believe kinda, you can't. Kind of helps. Kind of helps. You, you can't give to others what you don't have. Like I said earlier. So, yeah. assuming that is there, even that is not enough. I think the magic happens when you're able to create trust, mm. and trust is a impact multiplier, and trust is you know created when leaders are consistent in their behavior. Consistent. You can almost predict what they would do or what, you know, what they stand for, what they would do. And therefore, because you can predict that and there's consistency, you trust that environment and that leader. Right. Once you trust the environment and the leader and you have a culture of trust, you are creating the uh, the opportunity for both indiv individual and collective excellence. Mm. So then the question is, how do you establish trust, right? If it is about consistency. And I think to me, trust, uh, and I, I talk about this, you know, which this metaphor of a tree, uh, which I think captures it beautifully that if you're, it's all about consistent behaviors then your behaviors are like the leaves, the trunk is the thought that drives those behaviors, but the roots that nobody can see are your values right. and what you believe in and what defines who you are. And therefore your values drive your thoughts, drive your behavior, create your habits, defines your character and character unlocks destiny. And character unlocks destiny in the sense of creates a culture of trust. Therefore, for leaders and organizations to build a culture of trust, you need clarity of values. Mm -hmm. That is the bottom line. And the clarity of values. That who are we? What do we stand for? And then declaring them, making them public, and then being held accountable for it. Uh, both, of course, by other people, but most importantly, by yourself. Which is one of the things that I do is, every night before I go to bed, I'll ask myself, okay, was I consistent and convergent with my values of who I wish to be? 
And mostly the answer is no. <laughs> so, so then the important thing is you ask yourself that question, feel that disappointment and pain and resolve to do better the next morning. Mm. And that's how you create consistent behavior. Mm. And you do that consistently, then people actually begin to trust you, they trust you. You know, your organization embraces those behaviors. You have a culture of trust and that's how you unlock superior execution. And can I ask you, uh, there's a very important, let me ask you this. In what you describe, one of the toughest things is ensuring that in a big organization, as opposed to a startup, you know, a startup having run them, you've got this microcosm, you can influence it, you can build your culture. It's like, yeah, you know, we can make this happen. And you've got the big idea, you've got the dream, you've got the vision, purpose, the whole thing. It's working beautifully. As soon as you scale, because that's what you're a master of as well. I, I know you've done loads of different things. You have run these multi-billion dollar companies. You know, let's be honest. You've run these big companies where you're not the only chap or the chappy. You've got all these other people who have to sing from the same hymn sheet and believe in what you're saying. They're like, yeah, Niran does it, but you know, I'm not sure if I agree with those values and so on and so forth. Now, you have all of these characters who may or may not agree with you. So my question to you is, how do you ensure that the, whether it's a command chain or it's flat, you know, regardless, how do you how do you do this in practical terms? Because think of any movement, whether it's the Free India Movement with Gandhi or it's Martin Luther King or the Civil Rights Movement or any movement for that matter. There is a there's an approach one takes. What sort of approach have you taken? And and I'm 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 jumping ahead to say there are some characters who'd say, yeah, but you're not for me. This is not for me. The bad characters or bad actors. How do you deal with those and still sure, move I think, forward? Yeah, I think great question. So. I feel eventually superior execution comes down to the right people doing the right things the right way. And the right without the right people, nothing can happen. So right people are basically, I would say 99% a function of right hiring. You hire the right attitude. You can't right. train, you hire the right attitude. So that's the right people. The right things is that you're keeping a very tight focus on just the one or two things that matter most and everybody's aligned on it. And the right way is this culture, this common language. So to your, to your question, let me just share with you two important insights. So that's kind of the background. It's somewhat obvious, you know, you have to hire the right people doing the right things the right way. But yeah. I really believe that in large organizations, small organizations, the... Uh, the organization is a mirror image of the dynamics of the leadership team. The way the CEO and the executive team behave becomes visible in the organization. If you have bureaucracy, politics, infighting, lack of clarity, silos, you know, you can be assured it's happening right at the executive team level. So I really believe that the power of getting the right people with the right attitude who are convergent on how to work together is dramatically important. So getting the right executive team around you and making sure that they behave as one team, one dream is hugely important for you to have a culture of trust. Yeah. And the question is, how do you do that? Right. And I think apart from the obvious, which I'm sure your listeners already know that how do you, how do you form highly effective executive teams, well, uh, align them on purpose, align them on strategy, align them on, uh, on ways of working, etc. right? But I have found apart from those obvious things, a really highly effect, effective team has clear rules of engagement that they co-create and sign up to. So you take the executive team and say, okay, guys, you know, it has to be our way, our vision, our values. So how do we want to work with each other to make ourselves like a rock star team and not just rock star individuals? Right. And I, I have found that this will be a very, very powerful intervention. Take your team away and come up with a charter of how will we work together. Let me share with you very quickly some examples. Please. That, you know, I have found to be phenomenal in terms of transforming the way in which Rockstar individuals become rockstar teams. So the, you know, the the uh, easy way to remember is A B C D E. So A is this team. You tell them that you are the A team. You're loyal first to each other, not to your functional teams. 
that's the mindset b is we are all business leaders first functional leaders second mm -hmm. c is if there's a conflict it must be resolved directly with the person concerned no triangulation right and resolve that conflict in 24 hours or let it go mm -hmm. d d is no decisions without disagreement you must disagree. Somebody has to disagree and disagreement and productive conflict is great. And my favorite is E, which is eliminate hands from the grave, which is sort of, you know, I told you so. Like when things go wrong, there are some people in your team yeah. who say, well, if you remember, I was the only one who thought that this should not happen. <laughs> Don't want that. Yeah. So, so just some examples of actually hiring right and then co-creating how we work together with a team makes rockstar individuals into a rockstar team is what I have found. And then you act as one. Mm. And then you kind of really cascade that culture consistently of what I spoke of, you know, to create trust. Mm. Beautiful. I love it. I've never ever thought about A, B, C, Z, E in, in that way. You've now given me the model. I'm going to play this back, of course, and use it with my team and so should yeah. everyone else. Um, you have many such frameworks and techniques that you've developed over the years, right? I can, I can tell, and I've heard, of course, and I've made a list of quite a few of them. I'd urge you to, uh, I'd urge you to give one because it's so important because it, it impacted me. And this relates to tra trauma, difficult times, struggles, hardships, you know, recessions, etc. And you give this example of metaphor, I guess, like, or example, analogy or whatever of a windmill, and and I'll send it to you. Now the ball's in your court. You describe it. <laughs> well, you know, whenever there's a crisis, um, as we had with the pandemic and all the macroeconomic challenges, I, yeah. I find the role of a leader is to always inspire and create hope. Mm -hmm. You know, I've never met a leader who's pessimistic and impactful, <laughs> right? <laughs> so it, the job of a leader is to be... The oxymoron, optimistic. sorry. Yeah. <laughs> the job of a leader is to be optimistic and to create hope and to create, that's how you create energy, right? Yeah. Yeah. So I find, I found that, you know, as a leader, you can't be everywhere and be in every micro decision. So what you need to do is to create the mindset, clarify what's important and then decision filters. And if you create that architecture, then people at the micro level can make decisions that are consistent with how you want the organization to behave. And once again, builds trust, right? So it was in that regard that, you know, when, when times are tough, uh, the mindset uh, we were sharing with the team was, hey, guys, it's tough for everybody. We just got to be better than anybody, everybody else, and we will win, right? So this is not impacting us, it's impacting everybody, the, the pandemic and, you know, uh, the COVID and so forth. And therefore, we can do that only if we uh, play offense, that we are not defensive with what's difficult, that we stand tall as a windmill would to harness the fury of the storm coming our way and convert that into something good and not jump into the nearest bunker and wait for the storm to pass. That's not who we are. We are actually going to stand tall and look for opportunities in this difficulty. And that then unlocks, you know, a different mindset of you redefine success in a way. All right. You know, the old measures of success are no longer valid. What is now valid is that what are the opportunities that you're seeing and creating in these difficulties that nobody has seen? And it really unlocks, you know, the innovative energy uh, in any enterprise. So, yeah, that's that's, that's beautiful. I, I actually imagined it. I heard it on another session that you were running somewhere. And I was imagining a movie because uh, I'm visual, imagining a movie and, you know, this huge storm hitting this windmill, which usually just sort of runs at this speed and it's just going nuts. You know, you're like, oh, my God, it's going to come off its it's it's um base and how that energy i was trying to visualize how that energy is being built up into the in the energy vaults right which is actually an advantage for you so it's just i was saying right yeah yeah that that storm the bad stuff is actually fantastic because we we're here we're going to weather this storm together because you need everyone together to, to weather the storm i i loved it and uh you know again i will use that too in, in my <laughs> in my life and my journey of a of a leader so should everyone else and so you've got these fantastic examples these personal stories and so on and i just want to take you to another place which i know you will relate to which talks to something quite worrying actually which um i think is the next big 
well, I don't think I know, we know, is the next big pandemic, which is mental health. And if you think of, let's just take the West for a moment, you know, we won't go into the East because the East is a bit different. India is different and China is a bit different. All the young people are the same, but they are different in their own right, culturally. In the West, you know, the World Health Organization has done this study. It's actually a global study, but focused on the, the, the West to a large degree. And it's got some very scary statistics, one of which is a terrible one to do with young teenage girls, in that one in three of them have been diagnosed to have depression, clinically um, diagnosed to have depression. One in six adults um, are diagnosed to have depression or mental health or anxiety disorders and so on and so forth. And that number is increasing rapidly. And we're talking about everything these days, but we're not talking enough about this. And um, I wanted to get your perspective on it. One, because you have, you're have you an expert at this yourself. You've done it. You've executed it yourself and got through difficult times, ups and downs, and got yourself through difficult times. And you have a, a, a child, you know, your boy, and he's successful and he's thriving. And you have hired so many people directly or indirectly in these many brands that you've built and companies that you've run. So tell us a bit about how you look at, uh, and it, this might be a magic wand moment for you, like a Harry Potter, I, I give you over this wand and you're like, okay, af, I'm going to use the wand now and bang, and you go for it. What is what is it that you would do if you were given the responsibility and some magic power, magical powers as well, not just the pragmatic nature of it? What should we do to, to address this challenge? Is it in organizations, you mean? Uh, I, I mean, I mean uh, societal. I mean societal. Okay. I mean young people, the Gen Z, the younger people. They carry a lot of stress and pressure. We all know that. We know why. We've studied it. I've had people on the show who are neuropsychologists and people studying, um, you know, the anthropology of the mind and the anthropology of of why the are the origins of why a young person thinks the way they do. It always boils down to the parent somewhere. Fortunately, so we're culpable. I wanted to understand as a parent, as, um, you know, a, a coach, an advisor, a leader, a chairman, um, what message would you like to give to young people today? Um, I would be grateful if you could start with, because it's one of the most powerful messages I've heard you give. What is, and I know your daughter gave you this message and you realize this, is what is out of your control outside of your control, like can't do anything about it. And what is actually within your control, which you can do something about. Maybe start with that and then just give us some examples of how you think young people can cope with the stress and anxiety they put on themselves. I think that's a, it's a big question. And yeah, I it wish, is. It is. I wish it is. there was one magic wand, but like Harry Potter. But <laughs> I, I, I think uh, uh, it's a, it's a very important question. And, um, I'll share some perspective, but before that, I think about Aisha, as you said, I think let's have all the listeners just put themselves in the shoes of a 13 year old who's just been told that she has only five years to live. And imagine the, uh, the anxiety um, that creates, the mental pressure that it creates. And additionally, that she's much smaller, she's diminutive compared to the size of all her classmates because of her illness. She's bullied frequently at school. She can't not, not many people want to be friends with her because she looks different and she's frail. She has many, many issues. And I think instead of, and of course, all of those impacted her, you know, um, it would impact anybody. But she had this inner wisdom of having a good cry, feeling bad about it. But then eventually saying, okay, you know, what is it that I have control over? I can't control how others you know, behave towards me. I can only control how I show up. So if I want friendship, I should be a friend. Mm. I can control that, you know? Um, if I want love, I, I want to be somebody who's lovable. So whatever I want, I must be. That's a very transformational you know, idea that my daughter had. And uh, it's not that she was able to do it 100% of the time, but generally speaking, that's how she wanted to show up, um, yeah. always with gratitude, focusing on not what's going wrong, but focusing on what's going well, not despairing for what one has lost, but having gratitude for what one has. And I think having a gratitude journal uh, is a very powerful way 
to rebalance one's anxieties in life where you just take a moment and say, let me just think about all the things that are going right in my life. And it's through that lens of gratitude that we can discover and start seeing everyday miracles that are around us, mm. you know. Mm. I find gratitude to be incredibly powerful. And the third one, I think, is about the sense of generosity, of wanting to help others. I really believe that human beings can find huge healing if they turn outwards and, and they look for ways to serve other people. Um, that is a tremendous, um, again, a way to kind of seek balance emotionally in who you are. And that's what my daughter did. I think to your question, which is, I think, a very important question for today's uh, youth, I would argue not just the youth, but everybody, I think, in this world that is changing rapidly and has so many different pressures. I think probably talk about maybe at three levels, you know, environmental, then I think as as a coach, as a parent, our responsibility to role model and then for the child itself. So I think contextually, I think we have to work very hard to remove the shame from acknowledging that I have a mental health disorder. That is all right to say I'm depressed. It's all right to say that I need help. And I think that as a context is very important that we change somehow, make it acceptable for people to say that they need help, that they're struggling, I think is very important in terms of context. The second is, as coaches, as parents, I think role modeling vulnerability and sharing with our children moments when we feel inadequate. And to me, true vulnerability happens where there's a risk of you being thought of thought less of. So just being vulnerable and sharing something meaningless doesn't mean much, but I think risking it and sharing something that the other person might think less of you mm. is true vulnerability. And I think the more we can do that as leaders, as teachers, as parents, as coaches, encourages you know, the children to do the same. And I would say then the third thing, which is the, the child, is that to acknowledge the power of intervention. I think uh, therapy, personal coaches, I'm a huge believer of that. Absolutely. I'm a huge believer that being able to find a good therapist, a good coach can be a life changer for a child. And not having embarrassment and saying that, you know, I need that, I think can be, again, transformational. So that's what I would say in terms of, you know, the environment and, and role modeling and, and what the kids can do. Um, and finally, I think you mentioned that, you know, I have dealt with it. I would say that I'm still dealing with it. You know, it's like a stone in my shoe which, where yeah. it just moves around, but it's always there. And uh, I'm just, you know, a work in progress. I'm just doing the best that I can. I wake up every day and, you know, I'm still in therapy, you know. I'm in therapy. I'm, I, I have lots of issues with relationships, you know, and it, it never stops. It's part of our human journey. Mm -hmm. But I think being able to be comfortable with that, accepting it, being vulnerable, asking for help, you know, I think are ways in which I think we can probably uh, deal with this uh, more effectively. Mm. It's extraordinary. I mean, I, thank you so much for sharing that. And yes, it is a big question. And the, the, the solution is, has many layers to it, but I think you've summed it up beautifully. Um, as we close off, I wanted to get a bit of a sense of what what is next for you. Uh, I know you're in a leadership position right now. You've done so many incredible things. You have the benefit of all of this life experience and wisdom, and you've articulated that today so wonderfully for all of us and given us a lot to think about. Uh, where are you headed now in terms of, if not specific, but in just terms of directionally? Um, you know, you talked about your purpose earlier when you said, I needed, I needed, and I said to myself, I will never be in this position again where I can't help my children. And now you're at a different phase. I, I, I make an educated guess that you're okay now financially and you're thinking about other things. So what is, what is planned for you and your, your wife, perhaps? And you, I know you, you're both symbiotic, you know, your life partners, soul, soulmates. What are you guys thinking about now for the future? So I think, uh, I think I'm very excited and energized about the future. Uh, Super. And I think the, uh, I'm working on my version 3.0 with a wider screen with the, you know, 
more razzmatazz, better cameras. Um, <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, I always get inspired by people who reinvent themselves constantly um, because their self-worth is tied to who they are, not what they do. Mm. And I keep asking myself, okay, what, what is it that I can do now that leverages who I am uh, for the future? And I think where I've landed is, and what I'm thinking about is to inspire myself and others, including people I may not have met to unlock their full potential and live glorious lives. I want to be like a catalyst for uh, human potential um, to help other people, you know, become much better uh, than they thought might be possible. That's kind of where my head is at because I've always enjoyed that aspect of my leadership mm -hmm. in all of the companies. You know, the best legacy that anybody can leave behind, ironically, is, you know, people forget about your, you know, your impact on the business and stuff like that, you know, there's always more to be done. But I think the people that you and I remember and everybody does are people who made us feel very special. And the legacy that I want to leave behind is to really show up as a caring, empathetic, humane, respectful leader who always was committed to serving others, um, helping them become much better than they thought was possible. That to me would be a wonderful legacy. If people were to say, um, I really learned a lot and I went further than I could have, you know, uh, big thanks to the coaching relationship I had um, with Niren. I think that would be phenomenal. Wow. Incredible. I might be your first client then. <laughs> <laughs> but when it, whenever you come to London, of course. Um, what a tremendous conversation uh, that we could have for hours. There's so much more that we haven't covered um, and we will, we will. It's funny, you know, when you do these podcasts, I've been doing this for about three years, one learns so much, as you can imagine, because you have so many questions and so on. And you have to adjust your style to the person you're talking to and some are better than others and, and so on. And one of the most beautiful things about this is that um, every single time I do this, and I do it about three times a month, four times a month, give, give or take. I have someone like you who has this incredible life experience and these, these lessons of life, the, you know, that connects to purpose, connects to meaning. And the people who watch, we have about 30 or 40,000 people who watch this, you know, we all get inspired. And so I, I do want you to know that every word that you've said, even if it's a percent of what you've shared today will make a difference to all of our straight talkers, has made a difference to me already. And I know there's much more for us to discuss and connect on, as well as music, of course, that goes without saying. And I'm deeply grateful. Thank you for, for being so vulnerable. And thank you for inspiring me to share something I haven't shared before, by the way. Because thanks, I, thanks. If, uh, if I may, I want to just add one, yeah. one final thought. Please, please. Of course. In terms of uh, what I would love for the... Uh, listeners of uh, Straight Talk uh, yeah. to perhaps think about, uh, which is if there's one thing that you could do to increase the likelihood of you being more resilient and more successful, uh, what would that be? I would say that think of like you go to the gym to exercise your muscles. I think think of having a regimen to exercise your curiosity and your resilience muscle every single day and by that I mean that if there is something that you can't do so some people say I can't play music or I can't learn languages or or if there's something that you don't want to do which is I don't want to go to the gym I'm too tired etc mm -hmm. do that whatever you think you can't or don't want to is what you must get yourself to do Mm -hmm. Every single day, it could be just one thing, but that's how you build your resilience, your tenacity, and your sense of curiosity around you know who you are. And by exercising that muscle, you're getting ready for all the challenges that all of us are, <laughs> are invariably going to face. Failures of all kinds, losses and setbacks. So I would say build that resilience and curiosity muscle one day at a time. Wow, superb. Superb. That's a really lovely one. And um, before you go, 
how was the experience for you today? Um, was the first loved it, man. Loved yeah. it. I think you're 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 uh, very thoughtful. Um, very easy to talk to. Uh, I feel I've known you for many many years, and uh, uh, I'd love to meet you in person and yeah, uh, and build our friendship. I think you're a very special guy. Oh, thank you so much. I'm deeply grateful. Thank you. And uh, thanks again, Niran Chaudhry. And uh, do watch this episode. Click on the bottom right for subscription and to subscribe to, to our channel. Uh, may the force be with you. And Niran, all power to you, my friends. And thank you for being on the show. Really, really appreciate it. I'm grateful. Thank you. Thank you.